Hi everyone, I'm Shin Nishikawa from Kobe University, Japan. Today I would like to talk about the vocabulary use in speeches by L2 English learners in Asia. So this is the background of the today's study. So when discussing learner's second language use, we tended to focus on learner errors. However, it is very important for us to analyze the whole of the learner's second language use or interlanguage use based on the attested data set. In this sense, learner corpora can be a really important basis for the interlanguage analysis. And then in the field of LCR or learner corpus research, we already have a good learner corpora. So one is Jiku, this is a collection of learner essays. And then the other one is the Lindsay, this is a collection of learner speeches in the interview sessions. And then the both of these two co learner couples were compiled at the university in Belgium. These are very good couples. However, uh, they focused uh, on the learners in Europe. Then one question comes up. How about the situation surrounding the learners in Asia? And that's why the author I have compiled the corpus called JICNEL. It stands for the International Corpus Network of Asian Learners of English. Now, it is one of the world's largest learner corpus focusing on Asian learners. It comprises four modules, a written essays, edited essays, spoken monologue, and then the spoken dialogue. And then in this study, we will use the fourth one, the spoken dialogue, an interview corpus. The number of the participants is 425. They come from EFA regions, including China, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Thailand, and Taiwan. And then from ESL regions, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, Pakistan, and then the Philippines. And then some come from the English speaking countries, such as Australia, UK, and USA. So uh, in this interview, uh, there were 11 kinds of tasks that they can be classified into three major task types. The first one is conversation. And then the second one is role play, RP. And then the third one is picture description. And then the, as you clearly see, so the first one and then the second one, they are the dialogues. And then the last one is a monologue. So you are given the various kinds of questions or prompts, and then you are required to answer them. So uh, in Nishikawa 2020, I examined, I compared the speed fluency of the learners in different regions. As you clearly see here, so we have realized that the learners speed fluency drastically changes according to the learners regions. And then at the same time, the type of the speech, the speech tasks. Then, how about the vocabulary use? So do we see any difference in the vocabulary according to the learners L1 regions or learners second language fluency? And then which of the factor one and then the factor two is the stronger you know, factor to influence, to decide the learners vocabulary choice. And then that's the relation change according to the task types. So now let me talk uh, about the research design. Our aim is to examine the difference in vocabulary used in two kinds of dialogue tasks, so conversation and then the role play by Asian learners with different backgrounds. And then the research question one is, which of the region and proficiency influences Asian learners' vocabulary choice more strongly? And then the research question two is, what key words characterizes native speakers and then Asian learners? So uh, in this study, we used Jikunel spoken dialogue, an uh, interview you know, corpus, as I said to you before, uh, but uh, we paid attention only to the learners coming from the EFL countries, such as China, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Thailand, and Taiwan. And then we focused just only on the two kinds of dialogue tasks, conversation, and then the role play. We did not use the data uh, from the picture description section. And then we used only the data with three participants or more. So it means that we analyzed a 42, 42 data sets in total. So 20 LANA groups plus one native speakers, and then we have two task types, so 42 in total. 
And then the target vocabulary, in order to design the target vocabulary, we first really analyze 32 data sets with three or more participants, including the ESL regions. And then we examine the frequency and the spongion ratio. And then we excluded the words with lower than 90% dispersion ratio. And that's how we chose the top 100 words from the conversation task. And then we top, we chose the top 50 words from the role play task. As I said before, the size of the conversation task, conversation data, is more than double in comparison to the size of the load play task. That's why we chose the 100 words from the conversation task, and we chose the 50 words from the load play task. And then we adopted two kinds of statistical measures uh, in this study. The first one is cluster analysis, and then the second one is correspondence analysis. And then concerning the cluster analysis, the distance between the items, the variables, was defined as the square root of 2 minus 2r. And then the word method was adopted. And then the, concerning the correspondence analysis, item 1 and then item 2, uh, they were both scattered on the same plot. So now let me uh, move on to the results and discussions. Okay, so research question one, regions versus proficiency, which is a stronger factor to decide the learner's vocabulary selection. So by conducting the cluster analysis, we can obtain a kind of a you know, tree diagram and then the different data sets are clustered together. So if, if the you know, learners at the same proficiency levels are clustered together, maybe we can say that proficiency is a key. Proficiency plays a key role in classifying the data set. For example, Japanese at A2, CEFR, CEFR A2 level, Chinese A2 level, Thai, Thai learners at A2 level, if they are clustered together, maybe we can say that proficiency is more important than the legions in classifying, in classifying the data sets. However, if the Japanese learners at A2 level, B1, low level, B1, upper level, and then B2 level are clustered together, maybe we can say that the region is more important than proficiency in the classification of the data sets. So by observing the tree diagram, we can see which of the two factors is really an important key. So these are the results. The left graph shows the result of the analysis of the conversation data, and then the right one represents the analysis of the you know, uh, RP, role play data sets. And then the, let's pay attention to the conversation data set first. So the all the 21 data sets were classified into two big clusters, the upper one and then the second one. The upper one, blue ones, and they include the learners in China, Indonesia and native speakers. And then the green one, the lower cluster, uh, includes the learners from Japan and Korea and Thailand and Taiwan. Of course, it is to do that we see several overlaps, but basically, uh, you know, in spite of the difference in the second language proficiency, the learners coming from the same regions were clustered together in the same cluster. So it suggests that maybe the regions it's more important factor. Then how about the data from the load play task? In this case, uh, we see the three big clusters, the blue ones, green ones, and yellow ones. The first one, the blue ones include the learners from China, Indonesia, and native speakers, and then the learners from Taiwan. And interestingly, so in the conversation, Chinese, Indonesian, and native speakers, and then we see the same pattern once more again here, Chinese, Indonesia, and the native speakers, plus Taiwanese learners. And then the second middle a cluster include the learners from Ch Japan, Korea, and Thailand. And then the last cluster uh, includes the learners from Thailand and Korea, but both of them, all of them, are at the rather the lower novice level, A2 level or B11 level. So the discussion. So these analysis uh, you know, seem to show that the region is a more important factor than the proficiency. So in terms of the vocabulary choice, yes. And the learners are clustered, not in terms of the second language proficiency, but in terms of the regions or the L1s. And then we see the two major 
clusters, Japanese, Korea, and then Thai learners, and the learners from China and Indonesia plus native speakers. And then the, another important finding is that native speakers do not necessarily form an independent cluster. So actually native speakers are very often clustered together with the learners from you know, China and Indonesia. And then we see several overlaps, especially between uh, the Korea and then Thai, Thailand. And then in some cases, proficiency plays some limited role in data classification. So let's pay attention to the data set. So in this case, Korea at B11 level, and then Thai learners at A2 level, and then Thai learners at B11 level are clustered together. So the, of course, the regions are different, but the proficiency levels are almost the same. Next, research question two. What are the keywords? How about the keywords? So first of all, let us think about how can we can identify the keywords characterizing some speaker different groups. So by conducting the correspondence analysis, we can obtain two axes. One is the horizontal axis, Z1 axis, and then the other one is the vertical axis, Z2 axis. So with these two axes, actually we get four quadrants, four regions, the quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. And then the, uh, some, if some speaker groups and then some words are clustered in the vicinity, in the, in the nearly, so it means that they are they have a very similar relationship. The relationship between them is very, very close. In this case, a speaker one and speaker two, and then the word one, they are, you know, very similar in quality. And then speaker three and speaker four and then word two, they are also very close. Uh, yes. And then the, as I said you before, there are four quadrants from one to four, but the middle region, the central region is a kind of a neutral region. So this particular region does not show any strong uh, you know, character or in the feature so that's why maybe when discussing the features of each of those four uh, quadrants, maybe we need to skip the central zone, the neutral zone. So this is a result. Uh, this is a result of the analysis of the conversation data sets. As I said you before, we have four quadrants and then in the quadrant one, all the Japanese learners are clustered together. And then in the qu quadrant two, we see the native speakers. Of course, we see the learners from China, but all of them are in the central zone, the neutral zone. And then the, in the quadrant three, we see the learners from Indonesia and Taiwan and then Thailand and Korea. And then the, in the quadrant four, right? The quadrant four, yes, here, we see the learners from Thailand and Taiwan and Korea. So as you clearly see here, Japanese learners have a tendency to get, you know, uh, together, you know. However, uh, and then the Chinese learners are also clustered together. However, the learners from Taiwan or Indonesia or Thailand, they have a tendency to spread, spread widely. Next, this is a result of the analysis of the role play data. So as you see here, the Chinese learners B11 and then B2 are clustered together and then the B12, but they are in the neutral zone. However, native speakers, they appear in the quadrant four. And then the, all the Japanese learners from A2 level to B2 level, all of them are clustered in the quadrant three. And then the Korea learners are also, you know, in the quadrant three. However, they are in the neutral zone. So we excluded all the data situated, you know, positioned in the neutral zone, and then we picked out the words and then the, you know, the speaker groups uh, belonging to each of the four quadrants. First of all, concerning the conversation data sets, uh, we have four quadrants, as I said before, quadrant one, the novice, uh, novice and intermediate learners from Japan, and then the, they are characterized by the set of the words, uh, such as teach and work and now or something. And then quadrant two, uh, this includes just only the native speakers. So maybe quadrant two is very important. And then the you know, native speakers are characterized by the set of the words, such as of or get or match or first. 
And in the quadrant three, the Indonesian learners from intermediate levels, and then they are characterized by the words such as vehicles like me too or something. And in the quadrant four, the Thai and then Taiwanese learners at novice levels, they are characterized by the words such as talk and use and swim. So very, very simple action verbs. And then concerning the role play data, so we have four quadrants, and then the important thing is that quadrant for native speakers. So here we have the words with, or, and meal, or, or a, or of, or job. And then the Japanese learners, once and again, are clustered together in spite of the difference in the second language proficiency. And then Indonesian learners are also clustered together uh, in spite of the difference in the proficiency. So, now let us uh, focus on the keywords, uh, you know, characterizing native speakers in the conversation tasks. So the left, you know, uh, figure, left the table shows the very high frequent two or three grams used by the native speakers. And then the right one represents the same data set for the non-native speakers. So as you clearly see here that, so the native speakers use the of in the you know, construction such as sort of, uh, out of, a path of, in terms of, terms of, a bit of. However, these combinations, these collocations never appear uh, in for the non-native speakers. So maybe, so this is one of the differences between the native speakers and non-native speakers in using the uh, keyword of. So how about with? Uh, this is the number one keyword characterizing the English native speakers, role play, uh, you know, speeches. So the fifth, top 15 words, the top 15 are bigrams and trigrams are shown here. So as you clearly see here, end with, back with, happy with, and me with, there with, up with, work with. Uh, these combinations, uh, these collocations appear are used only by the native speakers, not by non-native speakers. Yes, we see the difference once and again here. So now let me summarize today's discussion. So our research question one that is, which of the region and proficiency influences Asian learners' vocabulary choice more strongly? The answer is maybe region, especially learners in Japan and Indonesia tend to be clustered together in spite of the difference in LT proficiency. However, in some cases, proficiency may play some limited role in data classification. For example, novice learners in Thailand and Korea tend to cl be clustered together. And then our research question too, that is what keywords characterize a native speakers and native learners? So the native speakers keywords are classified into, you know, one, two, three, four, five types. The prepositions such as of, after, with, and conjunctions such as and, and then articles, up and the. And then intensifiers, all, to, first, most, and much, and then basic verbs such as get and see. In other words, the non-native speakers are characterized by underuse of these words. So future plan. So of course we need to uh, analyze longer anagrams. In this study, we uh, analyze just only the biograms and trigrams, but maybe we need to pay attention to a longer construction. And we also need to pay attention to the word difficulty level. So maybe we can use two measures here, word length, right? Uh, shorter word and longer word, or the familiarity level. And then the quantitative analysis is also important. And then finally, we need to think about how to apply our findings for the ped pedagogical purposes. How can we teach the speaking to the students, especially the Asian students, in a more effective way? That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. This was really interesting uh, study. Uh, and um, I've been always fascinated with uh, uh, trying to validate uh, our findings in a way that we can uh, reach um, more informed decisions about our practice, our teaching practice. And of course, I'm sure everybody attending would see the prospects of uh, copying the same uh, study, maybe in our region, in uh, the Gulf region, maybe, and see how our uh, results would match. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
so again, I would like uh, to remind everybody that uh, please use our hashtag for the conference uh, so uh, we can get uh, better visibility about these excellent topics that we are having. Uh, and um, if you have any questions, again, I would encourage you to use the Q&A uh, part where you can uh, post questions uh, for our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, so let me now um, uh, announce our coming session, uh, which is uh, Khatma Al-Anzi and Muhammad Al-Anzi uh, from Taif University and Imam Muhammad bin Saud Islamic University. Uh, both are from Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, their talk is about language assessment, uh, washback effect on teaching and learning at high schools in Saudi Arabia. Go ahead, please. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Yes, good morning. We can hear you. OK. Uh, I'm going to present my paper with my, my name is Fatman Al-Anazi. I'm from Taipei University. I'm going to present my paper with my colleague, Muhammad Al-Anazi. It's generally about language testing and how uh, standardized exam affect on lang language teaching and learning. And specifically, the title of our paper is Washback Effects on and Off General Aptitude Test on Teaching and Learning of Arabic Language in Saudi Arabia. And we'll start with introduction and giving a briefly background of the topic, and then we'll explain the, the aim of the study and how the data are collected and analyzed. And later on, we'll present the findings and finally conclude with some recommendations and suggestions. Uh, in countries with centralized education systems, national tests are used as a primary devices for making changes in the education system. And the result of these high stakes tests can be used as an engine to introduce desirable change in teaching and learning around the world. They also can be used to support curriculum innovation. Uh, a natural to adjust their classroom activities to the demand of the test, especially when the test is very important to the future of the students. And this shows that the standardized tests have uh, a powerful effect, and this effect uh, can be uh, or referred to as washback. So let's uh, move on to understand what does the concept washback mean. Uh, washback is referred to as the influence of testing on language, <clears throat> on language and learning, and it's used interchangeably as impact or backwash. <clears throat> um, it's argued that the standardized tests have a powerful influence, and this influence can be positive or negative. The, neg the positive um, influence or washback occurs when the teaching the, when teaching the curriculum becomes the same as teaching to the test <clears throat> and negative influence occurs when there is mismatch between the stated goal of instruction and the focus of assessment <clears throat> sorry uh, in this regard Alderson and wall 1993 hypothesis 15 uh, hypotheses related to washback and language learning and teaching. And I listed a few of them that relevant to our study here. The first one is a, a test will influence teaching, then a test will influence what the teacher teach and how they teach. A test will influence learning and a test will influence what learners learn and how they learn. Uh, washback research mostly focused on the attitude, uh, attitude of stakeholders like students and teachers on teaching, learning, materials, curriculum, and assessments. So I'm going to give you briefly um, some studies on these areas. Uh, research on washback and teaching mostly focused on teachers' attitude and teaching methods. And they found that there is a positive and negative influence of the standardized test. So we'll start with positive washback or influence on the standardized test. It's found that test had an influenced both what the teachers told. For example, some teachers focus on the chapters that help students to score higher in the standardized test and how the teachers taught. Uh, for example, the teachers changed in their teaching methods using 
uh, like uh, more discussion and rule of lays, for example, in Hong Kong after the introduction of new examinations. And uh, there is also much heavier use of a practice task homework and more explanation of the test taking strategies as in IELTS preparation courses. However, some teachers feel time pressure and citrus when teaching for the exams or national exams and probably what they, they are worried about the scores that student will get. And uh, some teachers focus on some skills and neglect other that not assess in the, in the national tests or standardized tests like speaking and writing. And this negatively will impact student learning. And these then the, the negative impact of the standardized test. Research on learning focused mostly on students' attitude and their learning styles. And also found there's, there are some like positive and negative influence of the, the standardized test. The standardized test made the student work harder to achieve higher score in the national test or standardized test. They also, the standardized test also created a positive influence or pushback on student language ability. And that include expanding student vocabulary knowledge, developing their speaking and listening skills and developing the student confidence in using the language. And this is, and these are the, the positive effects of standardized exam. However, many students indicated that the standardized test increases students and anxiety and fear because they are worried about the scores that will get in the, the national test, which determines their future. Uh, like academic future. And um, the, it's found also not all standardized uh, exams or tests have a fundamental impact on student learning. For example, Chen 1998 found that the student learning strategies remained largely unchanged. Uh, studies on curriculum mostly focus on classroom activities. It's found that the content of teaching had a change for example, reading aloud being replaced by role of play and discussion after the introduction of national exams in Hong Kong. There is also an increase in test practice and explanation of the format and content of the test. The teachers also reported the changes in the allocation of time and emphasis on particular and their emphasis on particular skills like uh, they focus on writing more than like on listening and speaking because students mostly assess on writing skills. However, there was a narrowing in the curriculum. For example, related to writing, the teachers focus on writing genre that being assessed in the national exams. Um, studies on washback and materials focused on materials, material production, use, and contents. And in New Zealand, for example, it's found that the schools had to change their textbooks after the after the after the introduction of a new examinations, and the teachers relied heavily on textbooks in exam classes and working or using exam related paper public published paper or, or published material. For example, they used past exam paper to help students um, uh, score higher in, the, in their test. Classroom assessment also influenced by standardized exams. The new examination have a strong impact on classroom test design. There was like much more use of certain testing techniques like short answer questions and multiple choice questions that's similar to what's coming in the national exams. And there also um, was like an emphasis on the skills assessed in the standardized test or national tests. For example, there was more focus on reading skills because they um, uh, come in the in the national exams. Uh, Green 19, seven, uh, 2000, sorry, 2007 um, listed a number of factors mediated the, the washback or the concept of washback. And these include participant perceptions which were the importance of the test, participant knowledge of the about the test and the clarity of the test, understanding of the test questions and teaching and learning materials or resources. These can be affect or have an, a role in impacting those back.
Okay, these studies show the effect of standardized tests on teaching and learning, but they mostly focused on the effect of English standardized tests on teaching and learning in a global context. However, a very limited research examined the effect of washback on teaching and learning in other languages, like in Arabic. Arabic research on washback mostly focused on introducing the concept of washback into Arabic. And researchers mostly translated the concept of washback as tada'iyat means in English consequences, and ikasiya or isterja, like effect, but they didn't go deeply into the concept. Some researchers misunderstood the concept of pushback and they perceived or considered as only the positive effect of test. And to my knowledge, no study have, uh, has examined the impact of standardized tests on teaching and learning of Arabic. This shows that the pushback is missing, the concept of pushback is misunderstood and still unclear for many Arab researchers, raising the need for more comprehensive understanding of the concept. Uh, those, the aim of this study was to examine the impact of high stake testing on teaching and learning of Arabic in Saudi high school. Uh, it specifically focused on the verbal section in the national standardized test known as general aptitude test and how it affects on teachers and the students' attitude and their teaching and learning of Arabic. The study will answer the two research questions. What's the effect of GAT, GAT, or general aptitude test on teaching? And what's the effect of GAT on learning? Um, in this slide, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a brief in, like introduction about the, 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 the national test, or GAT. General Aptitude Test is a Saudi national test majors, students' analytical and deductive skills, and their general learning ability in high school. The student can sit for the test in, two, in their second or third year of high school. The, two, the, the, the GAT has two sections, a quantitative, which major students scientific knowledge like math and science and verbal section majoring students language ability and focus on their ability and making complete and clear sentence reading comprehension and their ability and understanding the relationship between words in Arabic. Uh, let's see how the data was collected and analyzed. Mm, 548 students studying at high school in Riyadh city and 35 teachers teaching Arabic language at those skills participated in this study. The study used mixed method approach, a questionnaire and some structure interview. The questionnaire was, was analyzed quantitatively using SPSS and the interviews were analyzed qualitatively using thematic analysis. The finding of the study uh, divided into two sections. The first one, the effect of the standardized test on teaching, which will include teacher's attitude and their teaching uh, method and uh, students, uh, what the effect of the test on student learning, which also include student attitude and learning style. The findings shows that many teachers hold a positive attitude toward the test and they think that the test is one of the most important exams assist the student knowledge and language ability. It's also important for a student academic future and determines their entrance to the university. However, majority of the teachers hold a negative attitude that, toward the test. They think that the test is not important and they are not responsible for preparing a student for the test. Uh, on the, the, effect, the effect of the test on teaching, uh, the findings shows that majority of the teachers they try to change their teaching method according to the test to help the student to score higher on the test. They use last exam papers and focusing on explaining some vocabularies that might come in the exam. 
Uh, however, many teachers didn't change in their teaching methods for some reasons, including lack of knowledge about the test. They don't even know how to answer the test questions. They had no role in designing the test. This is why they feel that they are not responsible for preparing the student or helping the student to, uh, to achieve better in the test. There was a lack of support and training for teachers to familiarize them with the, with the, the exam. And the class limited time was one of the reasons why they didn't uh, change their teaching. Uh, findings in student attitude shows that majority of the students express negative attitude toward the test. They think that the test isn't that important, doesn't really reflect the student actual performance as they feel that because they, they score higher in the classroom assessment, but then they got, they got lower in the standardized test or national test. The student also feel that uh, the, the exam or the national test uh, creates an anxiety and fear because they are worried about this, their score. The, 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 the test also requires a lot of preparation because the questions are different from what they learn in the classroom. And some students feel that scoring higher on the test is just by luck. Um, Finding, the findings also shows that a student made the changes in their learning styles and activities. They, for example, in these activities in a code answering a purpose exam questions, taking a training courses and preparing for the test and all these activities to score higher on the test. So let's conclude the findings. Um, the findings shows that or reveal that the teacher held mixed attitude toward the test and some of them like some of them made changes to their teaching but others didn't for some reasons. A student expressed negative attitude toward the test but they, they, but they made changes to their learning style. However, these changes in, in their teaching and learning are considered as a negative pushback or negative effect of the test because they were made for they were made for only high, scoring higher on the test not for mastering the language skills that is which is one of the goal of the education system uh, the finding also shows that there is a mismatch between the test and curriculum the test assessed higher high order skills like evaluation and analysis that a student are not used to and because students still relied heavily on memorization. There is also a lack of collaboration between the education and the test center, what do we call it, PIAS. Uh, the teacher had no role in designing the test questions. Um, um, based on these findings, we can uh, suggest the following. The teachers can adopt, the teacher can adopt uh, their teaching method to the test and focusing on developing student language skills, not on the test itself. They can consider some teaching techniques that develop a student higher order skills. Uh, training courses can be conducted to familiarize teachers with the test and how they can design their exam questions accordingly. Uh, there is a need for creating awareness among teachers, students and their families about the importance of the test and collaboration between the Ministry of Education and the test center is needed. Teachers and the student voices need to be heard. The, the national test can be used to reform education system, particularly the education system, the teaching and learning of Arabic language. Further research can investigate the alignment between the test and the curriculum, which is missing from this study. These are the references if you like to read on. And that's all about my presentation. And thank you for your listening. Uh, we thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khatima. Um, voice is clear. Uh, this was a very interesting topic for discussion. And I think uh, we have a question here uh, from Eric Robbins uh, about whether you attempted to answer the question about speaker to um, um, wash back. Uh, and and how, how was this point determined about uh, the answer to the question? Uh, sorry, I don't get what you mean. 
Uh, it's uh, speaker two, Topic Washback, mentioned that the teachers could not answer the questions. I'm wondering, did the teachers uh, actually admit not being able to answer the questions themselves? And how was this point determined? So can you please uh, elaborate on... Uh, the You mean uh, regarding the findings of... I assume, yes. The findings on the teachers? Mm -hmm. Shall I go back to the slides and explain it? I'm hoping that I'm getting the question uh, right. Yeah, I, I, I actually didn't understand your questions, but does he mean like the question of the research question? Could you please re read the question? Uh, speaker two topic washback mentioned that the teachers could not answer the questions. So he is wondering how, how you dealt with this uh, idea of not being able to answer those questions. Speaker I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting this correctly, but this is what is written. Did the teacher actually admit not being able to answer the questions themselves? Ah, okay. Yes. Okay, this is really related to the teacher's findings. Okay, the, the attitude of the teachers. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me just go back to that. Okay, so lack of knowledge about the test. Many teachers in the interview elaborated that they couldn't answer the test questions. The, the test questions because they tried to help their, their students to understand the questions and the teachers because and the teacher couldn't answer the questions because I, and, and this is my interpretation because the, the test is a new, the national test and is a new, and the <laughs> teachers like let's say for example the teacher has an, an experience in teaching Arabic for about ten years and this is a new format of the question with, which basically based on the high order skills most of them and the teaching and the learning of Arabic language in the classroom is based on like low level of uh, plumes taxonomy, like they, they still add memorization and understanding. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is, yeah, this, this is, I think this is why they couldn't answer the questions. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I just remind everybody that if you have a question, it's better that you answer on the Q&A, not the chat. It is easier for us to follow up on the Q&A section uh, with any questions that you have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Khatma. This was a very interesting uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we now move uh, to our next presentation, uh, Khuloud bin Siddiqui. Uh, she's from Saudi Arabia, uh, speaking about long-term effects of age of instruction on L2 acquisition uh, of rec reflexive binding. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, everything is perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm extremely excited to present my research uh, in front of such specialist audience. Thank you so much for the Applied Linguistics Lab for their well-noticed efforts. Also, I would like to express my deep sense of gratitude for the University of King Sultan for giving me the opportunity in this international event. And thank you uh, for you all for your interest in attending my slot. I would happily welcome you heartedly. As you can see, the title of my research is Long-Term Effects of Age of Instruction on L2 Acquisition of Reflexive Binding. My name is Khulud bin Sadi. 
Uh, at first, we'll highlight the following keywords. Long-term effects of age. Um, so we will discuss the age factor and instruction, which is the learning context and reflexive binding, which is the tested language property. The study is mainly about the role of age. So we can, uh, so can we generalize the widespread notion of the early the better into uh, the case of foreign language learning? Let's take a brief overview on the literature of age in second language acquisition research. The younger the better for successful language proficiency has been well documented. A wide body of research has found an advantage for early age, such as the work of Johansson and Huber, Tilsenstein and Abrahamson. In consensus, their findings confirmed that the L2 performance of younger learners is better than their older counterparts. The line of research was conducted on naturalistic settings. In other words, language is learned with direct, uh, without direct instruction. It usually occurs in the circumstances of full immersion, just like the case of immigrants. A question to be raised whether this finding is applicable to learning English at schools. Therefore, many researchers such as Gardia Mayo and uh, Gardia Locombri, uh, 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 Carmen Mune's work, um, you know, aim to validate this finding in the context of instruction. It tested the learners within the program of foreign language in elementary school. Uh, they found that no, uh, no significant advantage exists for younger L2 learners. These studies were widely criticized for testing a mix of young and old learners in the same classrooms, which allowed the older learners' cognitive devel development to appear as a confounding factor. Uh, later, in the early 21st century, researchers stopped testing young and old uh, L2 uh, learners mixed in the same classroom, such as the work of Muenth and Larson Hall and Thibeti. Uh, instead, learners were tested at the same age at the time of testing, uh, I mean in the long term, after they received comparable amounts of age. As for the research objective, uh, the present study contribute to the literature of teaching English as a foreign language. There is an ongoing debate in Saudi Arabia among parents, educators, and policymakers about the virtues of teaching English in elementary school. The age of L2 school instruction was lowered from grade 7 into grade 6, then into grade 4, since the Ministry of Education implemented a new program, uh, which is the ELDP, between the 2004 and 2012. The basic research question addresses whether the younger L2 instructed learners show superior performance compared with their older counterparts. So the uh, research question was formulated as follows. Is there a significant long-term effect of age on the onset of L2 instruction on learners' performance of reflexive binding interpretation? The study sample consisted of 24 Saudi Arabian female learners of English as a foreign language in Saudi Arabia. They were all college level, uh, at college level. They started learning English at schools within the same uh, system of instruction, yet at different grade levels, uh, at grade four, others at grade six or grade seven. Their average length of exposure to the target language amounts to 866 hours of formal instruction, which is a minimal input context. As for the testing procedure, they took a, a, a paper-based truth value judgment task in a story format um, in a generative-based, uh, in a generative approach to second language acquisition. It tested their interpretation of refle uh, reflexive binding. Uh, 
which is a property of language not explicitly taught at schools. Therefore, the test items should not trigger outcomes of explicit teaching. Uh, here is uh, an example of the test items. As you can see, they uh, let me show the laser pointer. Okay, they were asked to judge the sentences, uh, which include reflexive binding, whether uh, true or false, uh, associated with written stories. The test items uh, included six types of uh, uh, English reflexive pronouns, uh, you know, the six conditions. Here are some examples. Uh, moving on to the analysis, it was based on uh, descriptive and inferential statistics of mean accuracy. As for uh, the between group uh, differences, uh, one uh, way ANOVA provided statistics of each group's performance across the test items. As illustrated on the chart, the three groups showed, uh, you know, uh, performance differences. Uh, so we need to test whether the, these differences are statistically significant or not. The youngest group showed superior performance. However, in terms of the age factor, the three groups didn't show a pattern. As you can see, the performance is the highest for uh, grade seven, followed by grade, sorry, for grade four, followed by grade seven, then uh, grade six. It doesn't follow a pattern. Uh, then uh, the next chart illustrates the overall performance of the three groups across the six conditions of reflexive bind binding. As you see, this is the first condition and here is the performance of uh, grade four, grade six, and grade seven. And here are the rest of the six conditions. Um, you know, grade four scored the highest in two conditions, the object antecedents and the uh, non-finite local antecedents. Also, uh, grade six, on the other hand, showed superior performance in one of the conditions, which is the finite long distance antecedents. Um, as for grade seven, they were also capable to show, uh, you know, um, superior performance in one of the conditions, which is the non-finite uh, local antecedents. Nevertheless, the differences between the three groups were not significant. So here the, the p-value is higher than 0 0.05. Okay, moving on to the next slide. The within group differences uh, were compared via repeated measures in pair t test procedures. All possible permutations of the six conditions were obtained. I know it looks a bit complicated. Uh, anyway, we will discuss them in the following slide. The goal is to find whether uh, you know any of these conditions is more likely to raise within group. Uh, differences. When the uh, subject and object antecedents were paired, there were no significant differences between uh, or within the three groups. Here is the p-value is higher than uh, 0 0.05. Here we can see that the subject antecedent didn't show any significant differences, while the object antecedent raised significant antece uh, significant difference only um, uh, within grade four and grade six. Since the uh, p-value uh, is less than uh, 0 0.05. In finite clauses, locality was paired with long distance. The differences within uh, the three groups were not 
significant. Neither the uh, locality nor long distance uh, raised significant differences within the three groups. In non-finite non clauses, locality and long distance uh, were paired together. Um, you know, it showed significant differences uh, only within grade six and grade seven, as you can see here is the p-value. As for locality, uh, when it was paired for correct and incorrect responses of locality, uh, it raised significant differences among grade four and grade seven, while long distance raised significant differences only within grade seven. As for local antecedents, they didn't show any significant differences within the three groups. When the uh, finite and non-finite uh, conditions uh, were paired in the long distance antecedents, uh, you know, um, they raised significant differences only within grade six. So here is uh, the results. Performance differences between the three groups were not statistically significant. So central to the research question, learners of uh, English at grade four, grade six and seven performed all the same when they were tested at college level. Two conditions raised statistical differences within some, but not all groups of learners. These were the monoclosal object condition and the non-finite biclosal long distance uh, condition. However, uh, they they uh, appeared, um, you know, they were not interpreted as potential effect of age since they appeared within some, but not all the three groups. This interpretation was supported by White et al. in uh, 1997. They investigated the native speakers as well as, uh, you know, uh, L2 learners of uh, performance on the conditions of reflexive binding both native speakers and L2 learners faced ambiguity of interpretation in the same two conditions mentioned above. So uh, there were methodological dif uh, difficulties in testing these two conditions. Therefore, the finding of this study is in line with previous second language acquisition research on the long-term effects of age in instructed context, such as the work of uh, Carmen Muns and uh, Holodeth Betty. Uh, so in conclusion, the age at the onset of instruction is not a predictor of success in L2 learning. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your, for, uh, your listening. Um, now your comments and the questions are highly appreciated. Uh, thank you so much. This was uh, really interesting. And I think we have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, is whether uh, you can share the article. Uh, this is from Anonymous saying uh, they have uh, interest, special interest in the topic and they are wondering if you can share uh, the uh, article. And uh, now the second one. Okay. Uh, the research, it's about uh, how your research is mentioned to be taken from uh, Johnson and Newport in 1989. Uh, so how uh, did you uh, manage using it now in uh, 2020 in terms of uh, the age advantage? Uh, Johansson and Newport work uh, was mentioned just in the literature review. It was in another setting of learning. It was in the context of immigrants. They learn uh, English or uh, the second language in, uh, you know, with, without direct instruction. Uh, 
in everyday life. So we cannot generalize, and this, is, this was validated by research, that the findings of instructed contexts such as uh, Johansson and Newbert cannot be generalized to the context of school learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Yeah, as for the first question, uh, here is my email and uh, my Twitter account. We can communicate after uh, uh, after the uh, conference. I'll just, uh, you know, manage whether I can share the article uh, since it's, uh, you know, uh, throughout the uh, publication procedure. Excellent. Uh, yes, we do have a request for uh, more discussion of results. Uh, so maybe if you contact uh, Hulud, uh, we, uh, you can you can get your uh, your answers, inshallah. So thank you so much for your presentation, and thank you for You're being welcome. with us thank today. Thank you for everybody for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I think now uh, we would go for uh, a break. I would advise everybody to stand and stretch, get some coffee, and uh, we will be back. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure at what time we will be back. I think we have more time than assigned. Because we will be back for the poster sessions. Uh, 12, I think, uh, one fifteen. So we will come back at uh, one fifteen, inshallah. I hope you have enjoyed uh, all the sessions you had today. Thank you all. <laughs>